This week, Paul Batista, CEO of Polarity, joins us for an interview to talk about Polarity's power-up sessions. Then Rick Howard, CISO of the CyberWire, joins us to talk about the cybersecurity canon. In the security news, Nagios exploits, hacking a Boeing 747, bypassing container image scanning, unpatchable new vulnerability in Apple M1 chips, stop blaming employees, especially interns, spying on Mac users, don't tip off the attackers, security researcher plows John Deere, when frag attacks, and security by design. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. Keeping up with security issues across thousands of web assets without the right approach to web application security is a daunting task. Get ahead with web vulnerability scanning automation from NetSparker, a leader in dynamic and interactive application security testing known for its ease of use and accurate results. Detect a wide range of vulnerabilities in all legacy and modern web applications, address security bugs at scale by automating the confirmation process, automatically prioritize vulnerabilities, and assign actionable tickets to the right developers in their native workflows for rapid remediation. For more information on how to scale application security with ease, visit securityweekly.com forward slash NetSparker. And welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man for whom I have no witty intro today, Mr. Paul Asadorio. Welcome to Paul's Security Weekly. This is episode number 696, recorded on May 27th, 2021, right here in G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, to my left, Mr. Larry Pesce. Yeah, here back in studio after a couple of busy, crazy week things or something. But coming to you in 5G. Yes, <laughs> our first uh, in-studio guest, actually, <clears throat> yeah. since the pandemic has broken out. Mr. Paul Batista is here in studio. Paul, welcome. Thanks for having me on, and thanks for having me in studio. Appreciate hey. it. It's awesome. It's awesome. Very nice. We just need one more. I mean, we'd ha- we would had four people on set for the first time. We got to work on that. Yeah, we well, had, you know, Doug was going to come down, but hey, he you had know. stuff going on. So. Yep. <clears throat> on the lines remotely, Mr. Lee Neely is here with us. Looking a little crooked. You look, uh, you're not. You're not very level. Oh, you know, <laughs> something hit my camera. I just noticed. I am a little crooked. <laughs> I'll fix that during the show. Um, you know, hey, it is it is incredible to see a guest in the studio. I'm feeling left out, <laughs> but love to be here. Yes, we would love to have you here, Lee. So hopefully you can visit us very soon. Heck yeah. If you want to stay in the loop, all things Security Weekly, visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. <laughs> subscribe via your favorite podcast catcher to our YouTube channel or sign up for our mailing list. Join our Discord server and follow us on the newest live stream platform. That's Twitch. Join us for our June 3rd webcast at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, where you'll learn about pen testing tools and why every organization should be using them regularly, complete with a full demonstration of new features in Core Impact and Cobalt Strike and their ability to talk to each other. I saw a preview of it today. It looks really awesome. Join us on June 10th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time for our technical training on insider risk to learn how to quickly mitigate exposure risks. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts to register today. Slash on demand, of course, gets you to the complete archive. For your viewing pleasure, my teleprompter says. We are going with landing page because my teleprompter also says you should go to securityweekly.com forward slash polarity augmented reality for your data. It is one of the coolest utilities for security professional, or maybe even non-security professional. You primarily sell security people, but I could see it being used by a wide audience. But it is awesome. And it's nice to have you here. It's really weird talking to a guest here in studio rather than on one of my many monitors. It is nice to be in person at any meeting now. You're not right. on a Zoom call, absolutely. Yeah. So cool, dude. So what's going on, man? How uh, have you been? Been, uh, been busy. Been uh, not traveling. Uh, but been busy growing and scaling and uh, really driving value. So yeah, mostly cybersecurity professionals for our customers, but we work with Intel uh, folks as well and other missions outside of that. It's awesome. It's awesome. 
Uh, so what do we what are we covering today? You've got some some newer kind of features or. Yeah, so love to talk about, I mean, just for a background, I guess, on, on Polarity for folks who haven't heard what we do or what we what we accomplish or the value, I'll kind of give the background and then jump into some of the newer stuff we're working sure. on. So the, the kind of quick uh, overview here is Polarity addresses the problem of too many places to search and not enough time. And traditionally, that's solved with enrichment, right? Bringing in data into mm -hmm. your ticketing system, your logs, your events, and really trying to, to fill out that context. For Polarity we do it as an overlay because we recognize that inevitably you have to break out of that system. You have to go somewhere else. You have to detonate malware in a VM or you have to look at some raw log. And so we're doing it as an overlay across everything. And that overlay essentially is like augmented reality, as you mentioned at the beginning, so we can provide that context and thoroughness across the job. Now, does it work with VR headsets? <laughs> VR headset and goggle is unnecessary, so gotcha. it's uh, in the. That was like your claim level. to fame: is that you don't need a headset. No but need. But I've got for like an headset. extra one laying around. I was kind of hoping to use it. So I mean, if you want to use it in there, it would be a little redundant, but you could. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Don't worry, Paul's good for redundant. Cyclical redundancy. <laughs> that I was talking about earlier. So, but, but were there any checks at the end? Maybe. Okay. <clears throat> Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that was. Sorry. We digress. So for us, the new thing we got going on right now is some training. And so not your SANS courses, Larry, it's okay. not your, your, your full week, right? We recognize that folks are strapped for time. Uh, they're fully booked. They're fully utilized. And you might only have a few minutes to get some education. And we also recognize that a lot of the learning that gets done in, in the cyber field is done on the job. It's done while you're trying to solve the mission, while you're doing that investigation, while you're doing that pen testing. Mm -hmm. And that's where the true learning happens. And we're not going to kind of kid ourselves and say, hey, we're going to give you a, a 30 minute webinar and really educate you on a topic and make you an expert. That's just not practical. You need at least an hour. For you that. need at least a week on a SANS <laughs> course, right? <laughs> Maybe an hour. <laughs> so 45 minutes. What we've decided and what we've been working on is 15 minutes of training where it's showing what's possible and showing the basics. So we're so really instructing on where can you go to learn more later on this topic when you need it, when it is time to do it on the job and really learn and become an expert at it. Let's show for 15 minutes, hey, here's how, how it does, works. So as an example, one of our first trainings was on regular expressions, a skill set that many cybersecurity professionals need use time to time. And if you don't have that skill set yet, hey- you, Were you gonna say, the regular expressions are something we need to know and love. I you, you're, you're pretty twisted if you. I think you, you should love regular expressions. I think you should, but it's it's a rocky relationship. Like many, <laughs> like I'm many, it's a, it could be a love hate. It unless, could you, be. unless you take Joff Dyer's class. Uh, Joff has a. Is it a full day? I don't remember, After. but he'll be by later to yeah. tell you us got about it. 15 minutes on regular expressions? 15 minutes. That's and, what uh, I want to spend on regular expressions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. How much oh, could cool. you really learn in 15 minutes, right? You could kind of get some basics. You're not really learning about, you know, look aheads and look behinds. Um, <clears throat> insert uh, joke or pun there. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. yeah, how, how much could you, could you learn? So the, the goal there is, hey, show what's possible. Then if you need to learn more, well, take the longer course or get right to work, get right to building. And the pain you'll have while you're building, you'll do the real learning. And so we're spending 15 minutes and then we have a leave behind, which is with Polarity Free Community Edition, a cheat sheet that comes with that training, a cheat sheet on regular expressions. You know, I love that. I could have I used something like that today because I was coding in Python and I realized that uh, my file system stuff was a little rusty because I was coding in, not Rust, I was coding, coding in Flask. So I didn't, and there actually, some of their file system stuff comes from Flask library. So I was a little rusty. I could have used a 15 minute primer on like making directories, making files, writing files, reading files, not so much reading files, mostly writing, writing and structuring file names and stuff like that. Making sure files don't ex you know, the whole file system stuff. You could cover that in Python in 15 minutes easily. I spent my, like three minutes reading that Stack Overflow article or that article from this in three minutes on the other function, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So after you learn it, we'll have you on and you can do our 15 minute training on that module, right? That'd be awesome. Um, That'd or, be awesome. Or, 
But the, the goal there, so then if we were to do that, right, if we were to say, hey, what is that content? Boil it down to 15 minutes. That means there's no fluff, right? There's like very little or no marketing possibility because you have 15 minutes, right? It's yeah. just all content. It's important stuff. At the end of that, we would say, all right, well, what are the points that we want to remember so that if you don't touch this for another six months, mm -hmm. what can we put in the product, in the free product of community so that you can go back in there and find it. So like on the regular expression side, an example of that would be, hey, if I type in IP in Polarity, show me the regular expression for an IP or email or domain mm -hmm. or all these kind of common regular expressions you might find yourself writing, and then you can work off of there mm -hmm. uh, as an example on regular expression side. The second training we did, uh, we had a, a partner on. So we had Andrew Morris, the co-founder, or excuse me, founder of Gray Noise, come on and give training on the Gray Noise data itself. like. How, how to write queries on and what is gray noise. And then the leave behind there is a free community integration with access that just works out of the box. So you can leverage that data if you know, that's tomorrow or if it's six months from now, you don't have to remember that training. You just need to remember that it's possible. I like the 15 minute training. I think there's a place for that mm -hmm. certainly. Cause I mean, you can go find a video online and stuff like that, but it's rarely of the quality that you would want, right? Yeah, and the density of it is also kind of key, mm -hmm. right? So if you find a, a 15 minute instructional video, so I'll bring it back to like something that you know, maybe you're trying to figure out how to video edit, right? Something completely outside of security. Yeah, you can find on YouTube that video of how to do that thing, but it's usually buried inside of some other longer video and you're clicking ahead and trying to find that content. Oh, man, showing like that. Pluralsight, like I, I don't need the first three modules of like what this thing is. Like, just can you just start, show me some coding examples? Like I know what it is. Just, yeah, it's annoying. Yep. So goal there is, hey, cover 15 minutes, show beginning to end what's possible. Then you know, hopefully the references later to go find how to actually do the job you need to get done. <clears throat> right. How many of these have you done? We've done four so far. So the first one was regular expression. Second one was with gray noise. The third one we did on CyberChef. So CyberChef, for those not familiar, is a, a utility released by GCHQ that does uh, manipulation of data. So it's this idea of uh, take a, a data structure or data element and build out recipes and they call it like bake, you bake them. So uh, it could be decoding, encoding. Um, as an example, let's say you were- Oh, I, someone, I was someone who was using this. It looks really awesome. Actually. Very useful tool. So here, I'll give it like a, a user example. You are looking at um, a command and control comms and you see a data element in there that you don't recognize. And you, as an analyst, you'd say, hey, well, what is that thing? Is that, is that a command that's being run? Is it, is it data that's being stolen? And so you might want to go manipulate that thing. Is it base 64 encoded? Is it XOR? You know, I don't know what the encoding is. I don't know what it is. It's just a bunch mm -hmm. of raw data. You would take that, drop it into CyberChef, and brute force it or provide a bunch of different recipes to try to actually do analysis to figure out what that might be. And so we gave some basic training on that. We didn't cover all of CyberChef. CyberChef has hundreds of different functions you can do. There's no way we could possibly cover what's the full mm -hmm. breadth of that in, two, in 15 minutes. But we can cover the basics and show what's possible so that folks know to go use that tool later when it's appropriate. And then the leave behind for that, that training was an integration with Polarity with CyberChef just baked in. So if you throw in, let's say, into the Polarity search bar, you throw in something base64, it has this something called magic function. And if it meets the magic function criteria, it'll give you a suggestion like, hey, this looks like hex, or this looks like base64. What would you like to do? I suggest you do this recipe mm -hmm. against it, and then you might get some value out of that. Um, so that was the no. lead behind there. And then the last training we've done, so four so far, was on uh, Exploit Finder, which I've talked about on the show before. Mm -hmm. And this is that idea that, hey, Exploit code is all over the internet, uh, and I need to spend some time searching, potentially. If I'm gonna be thorough, I have a vulnerability, does an exploit exist for that? I should go check and run Google searches and Google dork to try to find if there's an exploit code out there. We've automated that research, and so we've added some functionality to exploit code, <coughs> excuse me, exploit finder integration on the community edition, and so we showed that new functionality. So do last time- Git, Do you search GitHub? We do, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's actually, one of the most popular sources that comes back. A, a lot of uh, POCs are out there on GitHub now. Uh, one of the things we've done since the last time I was on the show talking about Exploit Finder is uh, enabled freeform searching or free, just free searching. So before it was just CVEs you'd put 
put in there. And now you can search uh, a vendor name, an application name, or an application name with a version number, even an author. Uh, if you want to search on it, show me all the, all the code, all the exploits written by this specific security researcher. That's really awesome. What does the open source give me, Paul, versus the commercial? I know we talked about this before, but I've forgotten. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So the, the free version, the community edition of Polarity, gets you a whole bunch of integrations uh, out of the box that are pre-configured and some that you can configure. Uh, but basically, you're kind of fixed into just a couple you select and then a whole bunch that we've given you that we think are going to be beneficial, right, and provide value to you. Exploit Finder being one of them. Mm -hmm. Yara Finder, finding Yara rules and, and a sandbox searcher being a couple other examples of, of free integrations that are just available in that Community Edition. Community Edition allows you to search by selecting text and holding down Control C. So that's a shortcut key. So you can just hold it down and it, and it federates out all those searches. And you're limited on the number of integrations. You're limited uh, on the number. You can select kind of two to customize a bit, and then you're limited on the ones that we put on the I account. Gotcha. Yep. And we're continuing to add more there, so there'll be more value that we mm -hmm. give over time as we build these out. And as we do these trainings, many of these trainings are coming with additional integrations. The Enterprise Edition gives you a lot of those enterprise features like uh, role-based access controls and, and uh, various configurations out of the box, as well as... Um, the augmented reality view, so being able to highlight in line, and an on-prem server. So the biggest reason that a lot of our customers will move to enterprise is to bring that server in-house. This allows them to search across their internal sources, uh, you know, whatever repositories, like SharePoints and the Google Drives and the Splunks and the Elastics, all those things that are inside. But you, you, I don't have to write those integrations, right? You have those that I can say if I have, whether I have the server in my cloud or whatever, in our cloud or on-premise. I can say if I've got a Splunk server, I can integrate it. That's right. So uh, unlike many other kind of, uh, I'll say, uh, and we integrate with many of them, our partners on the, on the source side, right? There, you don't have to go through and, and write a playbook or write an integration. We have over 150 of them where you just pull those down that integration and it's going to work. All you're doing is, is adding in whatever necessary configurations, like adding in an API key, for instance. Uh, but otherwise, it's, you can pull it down. If you want to write your own integrations, or connect to some custom internal uh, repository or data source, you can do that. With the enterprise version? With the enterprise version. Because mm -hmm. I used the community edition. I was like, I want the, I emailed you. I'm like, I want the enterprise <laughs> version. I'm like, this is awesome. I want to use it more. Nice. Yeah, so that's one of the things. When you, once you have that server, uh, you can build against it. So you can basically- And collaborate. I think that was the, the thing for me is I wanted to collaborate with my coworkers. That's right. The other, the other big thing you get with enterprise is note taking. Um, so you get collaboration, of course, on the integration side, being able to connect to the same repositories and manage accounts uh, and groups. But you can also take notes on whatever text you want, whether that's names or IPs or hashes or domains, whatever you're coming across, you can take notes on that. And those are done in a very collaborative way as well across, across your coworkers. Right. I can see people tying it to an asset inventory. Is that is that pretty common? Very popular uh, integration, yeah. Uh, recognizing the host name structure, so they'll usually pick like whatever, however they're structuring host names, and we'll recognize that, and then we'll pull back data on you know maybe it's vulnerabilities, maybe mm -hmm. it's you know what's the purpose of the asset, who's the contact I need to call if that asset's involved in a in a, an event, and or like what the hell is this thing again? What is it for? Right, absolutely. Sometimes it's just an internal name, uh, right? And even with tied into that asset information, it says, hey, this is this thing, but the security analyst might not, still not know what that thing is. It's just a code word. Right. They pick up the phone, they call someone, they figure out what it is, and then that's where the note-taking could just fill in that asset details on the fly. And then from that point on, they have access to that, not just in the application where they figured that out. Right? Let's say they figured that out in the ticketing system while they're mm -hmm. looking at it. Rather than take a note in the ticketing system, if they take a note there with Polarity, wherever it shows, wherever up. It shows up in the future, across any tool and any workflow they do, they're going to have that note. Yeah, because when we were doing some product testing in the lab, securityweekly.com forward slash reviews, uh, we were running all these attack surface management monitoring uh, solutions. And like you'd run a new one and you're like, wait, I recognize that that host or that whatever before. I'm like, where, where was that? I'm like, we really, that would be a great, that's a great thing. That's why it's so popular in enterprises, right? One of the other things we can do with enterprise <coughs> is uh, capture analyst telemetry. 
So this is all the searches you do as an analyst and what you searched, like all your sources, and whether there was a positive result or not, and where you searched it from potentially. Mm -hmm. And so what this gives you, and what I, I'm finally proud to say we solved, one of the initial problems we, we set out to solve, we called IP deja vu. It's like, you yes. look at an IP and you say, I swear I saw I've that before. Seen that before. Why does it look so familiar? And then you lose time searching your notes, searching the internet, searching classified sources. I was at government prior to this, mm -hmm. to try to figure out that context. and. What we've done now is with capturing analyst telemetry, we can use that as a data source. So we can provide right back and say, hey, the first time you saw this was on this day mm -hmm. in this application. Uh, you've seen it a thousand times since then. Right. You should have recognized <clears throat> it. I don't know why you're looking at this, but and, and now the, here's the last time you saw it. And oh, by the way, two of your coworkers are looking at this as well. Mm. That's really awesome. So Lee? don't don't we have a a link to the is it the community edition through our through our polarity link off of the security weekly yes. site so paul what so is it people want to get securityweekly.com forward slash polarity <laughs> they go to go to town on that link but if they need the enterprise version they need to reach out to a different channel yeah if, if you're looking for the enterprise edition feel free to reach out just polarity.io go to our website um and there's a demo link there that will get you in touch with us to get you set up with enterprise it's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. What are some? Sorry, I chuckled because uh, you said demo link. I said, don't we have a re working one? Um, sorry. <laughs> what are some of the the most common use cases, Paul? So you you touched on one, right? Asset is a is a very common one. Um, uh, it really falls into the framework of you can define three things: what to recognize, what action to take, what to overlay. And so the what to recognize usually falls into the category of assets, as you mm -hmm. mentioned. It could be user IDs. Hey, who is this person, right? Are, you know, do they normally travel? Do they not travel, right? With, with, how they work from home, <laughs> which is very common these days, of course. Yep. Uh, is this the IP they normally come in from when they work from home, right? So getting, pulling back all that type of context, connecting out to your threat intel platform if you have one, connecting to intelligence sources uh, directly or open source feeds as well, and, um, or orchestration platforms, so connecting to your uh, orchestration platforms and kicking off playbooks. So you might have a situation where you're looking at something, you might say, was this in an event already? And we can check the ticketing system, we can check the, the, the orchestration platform and tell you if it is. If it wasn't, if it's new, you would know right away and you can hit a button to kick off a playbook and maybe start an investigation if that's appropriate for what you're looking at. Oh, that's pretty cool. On the, uh, on the government side, a, a very popular use case is uh, fake social media accounts. Looking mm. at, hey, is this, is this a, real, a real account or not? As, uh, as you can imagine, it's a, is a, is a pretty tough topic that we're dealing with. See, and I thought you were going to say creating fake some social media accounts, but I'm glad it went the other way around. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, What's the most popular requested feature? That's a good question. Hmm. Or do people just write their own integrations? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is you know, definitely the integrations. When they when they mention one, maybe that we don't have would be a popular one. The, the nice thing is now that we've been you know delivering to enterprises for many years now, is that list is getting shorter. So most yeah. of the time, when someone asks, and they're written for in some, JavaScript. You can write them in JavaScript. They're written in JavaScript. They run as a Node.js module on that on-prem server. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, it sounds like you made it pretty easy for people to do that. We've we've definitely optimized because of that use case challenge of recognizing that everybody's going to have a slightly different use case. Yeah. And if we're going to maximize value out to our customers, we need to make the system flexible enough to, to be changed by the of, customer. One of my issues, Paul, is when they make it just super hard to write any kind of integration. You know what I mean? Like I was looking at, uh, I don't know if I want to name the product. It's an open source product, but uh, it has to do with the stream deck, right? And in order to add your own module, I was like, wow, that's going to take some study. Like I got to read all their documentation and set up a whole development environment. And it just looks like a, compared to other things, looks like a really, like I've written like Nmap module. We've written modules for something. A lot of times it's pretty easy, but sometimes like not so much. Like that's a heavy lift. So I think my advice to you is make that as super easy as possible because otherwise you're just going to, the, the uh, bar is going to be too high and people aren't going to do it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. 
it depends on what you want to do. It can be really quick and really straightforward if you're just doing a simple API search, right? Very mm -hmm. quick. A lot of example code. This is the, the benefit of having a lot of pre-existing integrations, plenty of code to build off of, so you can learn from other people's work already. Right. Um, if you're doing something simple, like the first integration I wrote, I think was take a Unix epoch epic time and convert it to human readable. Yeah. That's like two lines of code, nice. right? Like super simple. The line of code to recognize that something looks like a Unix epoch time and the line of code to convert and it over. You can modify ones that are there. Like, can you fork it easily? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah very easy to modify. Uh, so an example where that might be appropriate is something like a Splunk or an Elastic. You can have uh, the data in Splunk and based on what that data is, you might want to change the logic to display it in a different way or display a graph or a visualization. Right. And other folks might want to just say, show me the count. Show me how much it's in there or the first time it's in yeah. there. Yeah, so, I don't like limitations in my software. I mean, it's why I run Linux. <laughs> I just don't want to be like, if I'm going to break it, I'll own it, right? That's, <laughs> uh, it, it's where, like, don't try and restrict me on stuff to save me from myself. Like, I'm a big boy. If I break it, I'll work how to fix it or I'll just start over, right? <laughs> Uh, Do you know how many times I've done that? Yeah. Started over? Sometimes you can start over. <laughs> yep. And it's and I was looking at the Stream Deck stuff, and it's not Stream Deck software, so it's uh, BitFocus Companion is the open source <coughs> for your Stream Deck. Mm. I'm sure many of us have probably played around with it. But when you execute a shell script, it limits you to 20,000 milliseconds, and then it kills it. What? And after trying to hack around it, I can tell you it probably does the equivalent of a kill dash nine because even though I had scripts that were ignoring signals, <laughs> like a sig term, <laughs> oh. it still killed them. So I don't know how so, it was killing it, but so, it was like super hard to figure out how. So my point with Paul is like, I went to go figure out like, well, how do I modify that? And it's like all the JavaScript is in dot pack files. So like they've packed it all. So I would have had to basically make my own distribution to be able to get into that code and modify it and or create a new module they let me run a shell script without restrictions. So that was like, I was like such a heavy lift. I'm like, I don't have time for that right now. So you know, me thinking like, yeah, you don't have time for that right now. I think might be a quick solution. Just hacker you like create a shell script that executes, but kicks off another shell script that I you that. really need to do. It still kills it. But the original one finishes. Child, the parent, uh, child inherits the parent process ID from a shell script. Yeah, it's we're getting off topic. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it! Uh, you can use the trap command to tell it to ignore signals, but it was still killing it mm. because in Linux and Unix systems, you can't ignore the kill signal for dash nine. Right. Which I, I'm like, okay, that that I understand. Yeah, like I, I accept that. that. that makes sense. I accept that. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. It was. I know. Why? But you're going down the. Yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> you know, because I'm like, wait. How do I hack this? Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely a hack at that point, right? Because you're trying to work yeah. outside the boundaries of the constraints that were yeah. made. Yep, the, and that's what I like about your platform because it doesn't sound like you ha you have. If there's constraints like that, I can easily work around it, customize it for myself. Obviously, you've got a support <coughs> issue if people start start doing that, right? But I would imagine the people customizing it are all pretty senior, you know, senior people that are kind of like us. Like, uh, if I modify it and I break it, it's on me. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a balance, right? So for mm -hmm. us, we recognize what we're good at. We recognize our value. And you try to put your constraints near your value, right? You try not to extend out outside of that value. So for us, the value is on that setting up the searches and the overlays in terms of the augmented reality on top of the screen, right? That's where our value is. So operate within the constraints of what to recognize, what action to take, what to overlay, right? And the overlay window is where you put that overlay. So if you're operating within those constraints, we try to give maximum amount of flexibility. Now, one of the things that was important just you know, as a startup, as a company trying to provide value out to cybersecurity professionals as fast as possible is we did need a base of integrations that provide that value. So it's that time to value for basic stuff should be just run a command, pull down the integration and mm -hmm. set it up by adding an API key. No right. code, right? Don't touch any code, just set it all up. And then get to a certain amount of value for that customer. Then the customer says, hey, this is really awesome. What if I connected it to this internal system mm -hmm. where we have this data that's relevant to our business, right? That's relevant to what we do as a business. And then that's where they'll say, all right, let's write some code, connect to that. And then at, at, our, at that point for us, we're providing so much more value beyond what they even you know, bought the platform for. And obviously that's good for renewals. It's good for expansion. It's good for referrals. So it's interesting because I don't think of what you do, Paul, as necessarily automating the workflow 
you're automating tasks inside of a workflow which yes. is so, so, it's super valuable but it's sometimes counterintuitive to think like i'm usually trying to automate my workflows but automating those individual tasks is really what you're you're after and there's some huge time savings in there. It's definitely very augment the analyst side, right? Augment yeah. the pen tester, augment the operator or the analyst, um, not replace them. Definitely not a replacement side. And then so when you say, all right, well, what are we going to automate from an analyst perspective? There's the time savings. So we say, all right, we're going to automate the busy work, the research, right? This is, you know, back to the pen test example, the, the 10 sites I would have gone out and checked if mm -hmm. I had, you know, if I wanted to see if there's an exploit that exists for it. That's the research. That's the busy work. That's just save some time. But then when you kind of think about that a little more, it's like, oh yeah, but I'm also helping with that balance between thoroughness and speed. So if I'm a, a pen tester and I say, well, I get lazy and I check six of those sites and then I give up, well, yeah. I just lost some thoroughness. So for us, it, we look at it as that time savings, but then we look at it as, hey, can we maximize the amount of thoroughness? And then when you, when you look at it from that perspective, you start asking the question, what is the data that my team needs to know? Where, where do I need to inform them? And then that's where you say, all right, well, I need to connect to that source so that that data goes to the analyst automatically. And that's the augmentation. That's the thoroughness component. Hey, when they're looking at something, they're going to know they've seen it before or they're going to know it's in this threat repository. I like it because many of us have written scripts that are like, when I have this piece of data, I want to automate sending it to all these different sites and cross-referencing it, right? But then, one, I got to write the script. Two, I still have to like take my piece of data, usually copy and paste, go to some web interface or a command line, run it through my automated script. You've made it even better than that. Now it's just part of my normal workflow and I can just right click on something and do that. And the, the best part is I don't have to write that code. I'd rather be writing different code, quite frankly. Maybe, right? yeah, then, maybe, or you right? take that code, right? That script that you have. Maybe you drop that into the integration yes. framework, and that's the second part of that. So what to recognize is the thing you would have pasted into that script, and then the action to take is that script, right. and then the thing to overlay is the output of that script. And now you have that thing, and you've kind of short-circuited. You're still running that script, potentially. CyberChef's a good example. We're still running CyberChef. Yeah. We're just running it it's just in a way that's embedded and yeah. available to you everywhere you go. It's still CyberChef in the back end. It's still that same code. Can you do it on mobile? Uh, we are working on some web-based stuff where mobile would be more accessible. Mm. Um, from a you know, general algorithms perspective, recognize pixels on a, on a screen or a mobile phone camera. We've, we've tested our stuff on that. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that most of our customers are not doing their work on yeah, mobile. Yeah, so it's not worth your R&D time. It's, it's, it hasn't been, it, <clears throat> other than a, you know, a, a, a search, right? Like yeah. if, it's, if it's on mobile, it's because they want to look up one thing because they're getting an alert late at night. It's not because that's where they're doing their work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I gotcha. And oh. you can run this on all Windows, Mac OS, and Linux? Windows, Mac, and Linux. Yep, certain flavors of Linux, but um, Windows, Mac, and Linux. It ran great on Ubuntu. 24 by the way ubuntu is a supported distro yes <laughs> <laughs> that's the hard part of uh creating software for linux is all the distros do it differently it is it, and w oftentimes it runs on many distros we don't support but you, <laughs> you know you're kind of constrained at how many things can we officially support yeah uh, right, sure. yeah so uh you know the, usually the folks that are uh, running the distros we don't support are more than willing to, to put it the time to in. hack it together to make sure they got yep. the libraries. Usually, it's just pulling down that. Well, you you know you've been in dependency hell. It's pulling well, down the the things that you I, need. I like <laughs> live in dependency hell. I'm like, I'm like, why is that still a thing? At least it's not the old Red Hat days when you'd ask to install Package X and it says, no, 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 you can't install Package X. You need Package Y. All right, I'll go install Package Y and says, no, you can't install Package Y. You need Package X. <laughs> I do run into it less and less, though. Yeah, I very rarely. Usually it's like, hey, you need package. Uh, you want to install package X. You need package Y. Cool, I install package Y. It says, no, you need package Z. Mm -hmm. And then package Z says, oh, you need package double X. I'm like, all right, double X. This is Y, Z. Done. I can do that. The one that tripped me up recently, and I've, I compiled OpenVAS from scratch. I'm so sorry. Um, someone created a great guide, and I, I, I thanked him on Twitter. Because uh, I was like, thank you, you saved me so much time. Um, and I did <clears throat> THC, Hydra, Nmap, all went swimming. I mean, you, you don't necessarily have to do that, right? It was more of kind of an academic kind of uh, exercise, part of our labs testing. 
the one that got me was medusa and that's the one where like if you get so old like it needs this revision of the library and that revision just oh. doesn't doesn't exist in the repos so i'd have to go compile that library and that's when you go down then when you compile that library it may depend on stuff that isn't in the distro so i think when software gets so old it's almost not worth worth the effort when uh you remind me of kind of how i got into security the um firewall guy got sick i was <laughs> that's my story <laughs> I, w I had a, a paper due uh, for college, and I thought it'd be a good idea to do a stage one install of Gen 2 Linux. So I printed out oh, the manual. Wait, when is that ever a good idea? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not a good idea, right? So I printed out the manual. I only had one machine, which is another mistake. If you're going to mess with Gen 2 back then, at least, you should probably have a couple computers around you. No, so I you think that's still true today. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But now they come in virtual flavors, right? Mm-hmm. So... So, yes. so I, you know, bash my head up against the wall until I get it working. I mm -hmm. finally get it working. It was awesome. Once it was working, it was like a, an older laptop and it, it screamed just having that, that everything compiled for the hardware. It wasn't like, oh, I got it working. Oh, wait, now what do I do with it? <laughs> well, other than, you know, well, when you get it working and then you're like, well, how do I add a, add a GUI, right? Like yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that side of it. But, uh, but here's where, where it ties into security. So that was good, just education in Linux. Mm. Then a friend said, hey, check this out. And he hands me a CD. And it was Nopix STD. And I throw that in there, and it's the equivalent of what uh, Kali backtrack, right? Yep. Like uh, back then. And, and I throw mm -hmm. it in, and it was like everything was working. I'm like, why did I do all that other stuff? And then it had all the security tools on it, which then I just started playing. But good in. learning experience. Good learning experience, yeah. But then I had all those security tools that were all of a sudden easy, and it was like instant script kitty, like yes. mess no, with I, stuff. Yeah, right. Yep. Yep. I, uh, I tried to install Pen2 once, and I never finished. Sorry, yeah. not, not Pen2. Gen 2. Mm -hmm. There yeah. was a pen. There was a there, pen. There still yeah. is. There still, still is. is. Yep. <clears throat> Zero Chaos is the, the lead maintainer, lead developer for pen 2. Oh, interesting. Yep. Still. So I haven't checked it out in a while. Yeah, I haven't either. Containers have made still, that. Still still a thing. St containers are really cool <clears throat> for that. And I when I first started playing with containers, there wasn't a whole lot of containers for security tools. There's a lot more today. Your mileage is going to vary. Mm -hmm. Um but it's super easy way to get stuff running without having to compile into i mean i do encourage the youth of today like to <laughs> you need to experience that that's how you learn right but in a pinch spinning something up in a container is just sometimes provided the person who's maintaining that container because oftentimes it's not the package maintainer or open source it's a third party uh, it's a third party that's just like i and i gotta like check your work dude and i'm like you don't really want to be running that as root and like mm -hmm. doing just like bad security things in the container and i'm like eh, that's not good um yep. and there is another person i probably should recognize on the show they maintain uh the open vast container so uh, that was the, the easy way so i ran open vas with containers had a pretty easy time i had to make some slight adjustments but it was like one shot command and open vas was mm. up and running i'm like that's too easy i need a harder way you know to do it so my my thing with the, so many of the security tools that I use from day to day, um, containerization doesn't work that great because normally, I, in some cases, I need access to hardware. Mm -hmm. And yes. my understanding is that USB will work pretty well sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but, I haven't gone down that route. But every time I've tried to use some tool in, in like Docker that requires access to the USB, mm. no, no, like oh yeah, no. we'll use this wireless wireless tool in a container i'm like nope i did where's my wi-fi adapter nope where's my bus pirate nope, nope. where's my hacker f nope <clears throat> get give up <laughs> pip yep. install dash requirements dot txt yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah all right but i, I was Go ahead. i was looking at the integration page and it seems like you've got twice as many integrations as when last we talked have you guys been just going to town there or what yeah, just building away. So it's it's the nice thing about having a user community and customers where they drive requirements and they build stuff and contribute. Um, there's uh, there's do also you, been Paul. Do you maintain that stuff or do they or is there kind of a split? It's a great question. It's kind of a balance. Um, many of them will maintain. So if we think there's going to be a lot of value across many different customers, then we'll take the lead on making sure and, and maintaining it. If uh, if a customer 
is doing something you know more specific to their organization, then you know they would own that and maintain it. Of course, we're going to support them as as needed, uh, but right. they'll they'll have the full ownership over it. And of course, there's there's many integrations for customers where we don't even see them. We don't even yeah. know. Like yeah. you know, sometimes we hear this uh, success story of what they built, but uh, yeah, for the most part, they're operating on an environment where. Uh, it's confidential and we don't get to see other, other than hear about the success. My advice, and, and this is totally free because it's probably what it's worth, is... <laughs> <laughs> Nickels are worth a free advice. Keep an eye on that because if people develop modules or extensions and don't keep them up to date, someone will go and use it and have a horrible time and then think you're a jerk because you make crappy software, right? Um, Sneak has a really cool thing. I don't know where I came across it, but it's like an evaluation of a software library or open source product and they look at the number of commits the number of contributors how frequent the updates are and they kind of generate a score right of like sure. this is pretty actively maintained software i'm like cool that's the one i want to use because oftentimes mm -hmm. you know you're looking for a solution and i'm balancing between like what's the best way to do something versus like the easiest and secure right and all of those are factors and if like sneak is it like a horrible score, I'm like, yeah, I, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I, could, right? I couldn't even do some of that. Like some of the stuff I'm looking at for doing research or some wireless stuff. And I'm like, oh, I'll go to GitHub and I'll search and I'll see if I can find some code for that. And I'm like, well, I get the one that was updated seven years ago or I get, yeah, I get the one that's seven, that's updated yeah, seven years ago. Yeah, because that's the only one that exists. Yeah, it's the only one that exists. Or the other one is like not complete or has no documentation mm -hmm. or is some piece of C code that doesn't work. I'm like, Maybe maybe a hack hmm. would be to pick the one that when you Google search it, it has the most hits. I like that. Because yeah. it's the most it, people talking about it. Maybe the least yeah, yeah. that's usually more actively maintained. Right? Yeah, that mm -hmm. could be in Sneak's algorithm too. Yep. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah, we've been bu busy building integrations and we expect that for some of these trainings and upcoming trainings with each one, uh, you know, call it a constraint on ourselves. We said, all right, well, if we're gonna be doing training, this will kind of force us to also have new content, valuable content coming out on a regular basis when it comes to community and providing more and more value as we go forward. Uh, so like some upcoming ones uh, that are new integrations since the last time we talked is uh, is the Sandbox integration, Sandbox Finder. So this, this is gonna take your file hash, your domain, your IP, and search across the public malware sandboxes. Mm -hmm. So not your local cuckoo, although you could do something like that if you wanted to. It's more, it's gonna search across the, the Joe sandbox, the hybrid analysis, the any.run, the virus total, and provide mm -hmm. you access there. And what, what I like about that integration isn't the kind of traditional, I mean, you're probably gonna search by the, the file hash is probably gonna be the most popular search, MD5 or SHA, mm -hmm. right? But the, the other thing you could search by is just a, an, a random string. So you could search by maybe the file name, maybe maybe a, a sequence of bytes, and still get results back. So this could pro potentially, as a as a, an analyst, provide you other samples that are relevant to, or the precursors to the one you're dealing with in the moment. It's really awesome. So I think that's one of our upcoming training we're doing on sandbox uh, analysis, uh, and then uh, Yara Finder is another one that kind of stumbled upon uh, and I, I've seen it as valuable for our customers, which is find the Yara rule mm -hmm. that's associated with a given thing. Given thing could be APT33, or it could be CVE XYZ, or it could be an IP address or, you know, Hafnium, an actor, right? So uh, that, that's been a new one as well that searches various sources on the internet that we've identified as uh, useful for spotting and, and finding Yara rule content. And the other like awesome benefit of just building these in general is as we get more and more folks in the community edition, they're providing more sources back. So I think, right. I think Paul, you even gave us one that we added to Exploit Finder. Right? The, the more yeah. users we get, the more mm -hmm. they say, hey, you know what, I searched this spot. This is where I find stuff useful. And then we just add it to it, simple for us to add, and then more value out to that community. It's awesome. Nice. You make me want to use it more. <laughs> it's mission accomplished. It's really great. Sold. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, folks can go to the website and get the community edition, right? I, I know we had a, a, a special version for our listeners at one time, but like, doesn't matter how they acquire it. You can go there, just create an account. You can just go to the website, polarity.io. Uh, it'll ask you a couple questions and create an account for you. 
And then, yeah, if there's any any feedback, any integrations you wish were on there, you just right. email us. So customer success at polarity.io. Uh, to the team, my team's awesome. And Usually do you responsive. expire accounts? Like if I had an account or one of our listeners had an account months ago, a year ago, is it still? It's possible that it got inactive, uh, mm -hmm. but we'll stand you back up. Uh, so just email the... What email there's usually a password reset link as well so if you <clears> just <throat> forgot your password did the password reset link uh or email us or just sign up again and it'll create a new account so there's not um if you logged in there's a we probably didn't expire the accounts that might have expired would have been if you signed up and then never logged in i got you uh yeah okay. that those would have been the ones that would have been expired um but if you awesome. actually got in and configured stuff it shouldn't have expired just Sweet. reset your password nice. or log in awesome nice. I remembered my password. It's in LastPass somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's all you need to know. It's in LastPass. Awesome. Uh, so folks can uh, still visit securityweekly.com forward slash polarity. The link is still live. Go check it out. Get the community edition. And I guarantee you're going to use that and be like, yeah, I might want the enterprise version. Because that's uh, after when you came on the last time, I was like, yeah, we, we, we need to get that. We're still working on it, but we're, it's on my list. It's on my list. It's awesome stuff, Paul. Awesome. Appreciate it. And hopefully you get value out of community too. Uh, but yeah, always, always happy to get folks on enterprise. Either one, we're happy. Awesome. awesome. With that, we will take a short break and come back with our next interview. Stay tuned. <laughs> 